Did you miss me? So sorry to be late. Hopefully I can make up for lost time. Welcome to Watches Tonight. Guys, we've got a great show on the slate and we're talking everything from Rolex and Patek Philippe wait lists to dress watches you can take swimming. And of course, the primary feature, a one-man forensic festival, the trial of Richard Mille, a Lincoln Douglas extravaganza in monologue. Welcome friends from around the world and thank you for sticking with me through the delay. Eddie Landsberg, Michael Garrard, Matt Foster, Morimo Levin, Jan Wilhelm Koster, Eric Nielsen, Joe D, Andrew, Tom P, Blue Shirt Buddha, Squiggly P, Marco, Cedric, Watch Doctor, and Philippin Zippo. Welcome Neuro, Angie, Andrew, ST12, and Luis M. Guys, thank you for joining me. This evening, I want to emphasize that before we jump straight into our wrist shots, there is no better place than the watchbox.com when the time has come to buy, trade, or sell watches. Especially when selling, we pay fast, we pay cash, we make it fun and easy. 24 hours a day and we are global. I will pay you for the privilege. Uh, visit our website, check the link in the description below, and this month, February, I'm giving away the Omega Speedmaster Professional. That's right, the Moonwatch. And not any Moonwatch, vintage, 145022 with original tritium dial, but you got to be in it to win it for February. Once more, link in the description. And help me fill the gap, I'm trying to hit 50K and 2K19 on Instagram. It's my newest thing, 60 second snippet videos, mini reviews, you're gonna love them. Open me, separate window, follow me on Instagram, keep me streaming. Now. Viewer wrist shots for the evening. Chaz M checks in from his mobile office with his Zinn 556 and a glorious Roland Freightliner. That is my favorite watches and wheels ever. He even managed to get some ink in the corner of the image. Abdul R of Germany shares a rare American watch in the Black Forest with his Devon Tread 1. Very cool. Jordan borrowed Time78, a friend of ours on Instagram, and a friend of Watchbox sports his Nautilus 5711, and it's looking glorious. I love the coordination of furniture and dial color. Leon K of Adelaide, Australia, stays on time with Mickey Mouse, and you thought he was limited to the Magic Kingdom. Far and wide, the mouse is everywhere. Send your wrist shots to Monday Mailbag at thewatchbox.com to see your pieces on these pixels. All right, Brad F. jumping in, asking Tim, when would you wait for a watch? and when would you be inclined to seek other options rather than wait? Okay, honestly, there are a few reasons to wait for a watch and many of them involve your ability to know yourself. Honestly, if you're fixated on a model long-term, that should be your first clue that buying a surrogate will result in disappointment, return to the primary target, and ultimately buying two watches and selling one at a loss. So I would say if you're really fixated on something specific, stick with it. Moreover, you really need to ask, have I bombarded myself with alternatives? Because the deeper you dig into the watch world, the more likely you are to find something available immediately that is absolutely awesome and costs less than your original target. It's a big world out there. And the more research you do, the closer you're gonna to come to that answer, should I wait it out or go for something now? I'll also ask, do you have the cash to buy the Target watch? Because that's always important. I always say when you can't buy the watch with cash, don't finance fun. That's a big one. Uh, second, I would say, if the Target watch is subjectively worth more to you than an alternative, plus the time you would spend with that alternative prior to getting your original choice, then maybe, maybe you go with your original wait-listed Rolex or Patek. But other words, would you wait 18 months rather than own an Omega Seamaster Professional Diver now, enjoy it for 18 months and pocket $4,000 or wait those 18 months and get the new Rolex Hulk. Because frankly, I would go with the Omega, the time and the money. So these are the decisions you have to weigh. Critically, not all watch weights involve a new Rolex or Patek Philippe purchased from the dealer. And this is something you need to consider when you're looking at specialized watches, the vintage or the esoteric. The more specialized your target, the more likely that you've had some time to think about this, delve deep and get in touch with your tastes. If you're looking for something exotic, rare, vintage or specialized, there may not be many on the market at any given time. And you might have to wait for that watch to come up. For example, waiting now makes sense because a high-grade example of a Rolex Truebeat from the mid-50s with its deadbeat second system, or a Longa Zeitwerk Lumen, which is scarce and coveted, they don't always pop up, but if you know that's what you want, you're gonna have to scratch that particular itch, and buying something else will ultimately mean buying twice. So, be ready to walk away from a compromise in style or condition. This should be exactly when you decide waiting is worth your while. 
friends in the box. I can see the Watch Lounge, Eric Cecil, Gerald at Large, Dustin Van Patten, Clive Watch Wrangler, Ruben P, Kyle K, David B. I see friends of the brand, including Ooh, Bear Clooney Watches just joined us. All right, and Zeus87, Thomas Burnett, regular viewers. Thomas is wearing his Kermit right now. Next question. Faisal A asks, are there highly water-resistant dress watches that you would recommend? I want a watch with greater elegance than a sports style, but I also want to be able to swim with it, take it outdoors, wear it as a full-time option. Indeed, I can think of many, and you have good choices in many styles and many sizes from many brands at many price points. Let's start at the top of the market first. If your budget accommodates Rolex Day-Date money, I would absolutely make that a target. Unlike the steel sports watches, the Rolex Day-Dates, which are always ever in precious metal, are available immediately from the case at your Rolex dealer without any kind of a weight. Moreover, these watches offer 100 meter water resistance, the same movement architectures that you'll find in the GMT, the Sub, the Daytona. They're sports watches on the inside, and with screw down twin lock crowns, they are also sports watches on the outside. Get them in either platinum or white gold to dress them down a little bit and make them that more versatile all the time watch. Color gold doesn't always work as an all-the-time watch, whereas a white metal 36 to 40 millimeter day date, or if you want to go a little bit bigger, a day date two with the 41 millimeter case, those are great options if you're looking at a top of the market, all the time swimmable dress watch. Now, if you want a more perhaps universal complication, you definitely want to consider the 2000 16 Zin 910 anniversary. This is a lovely watch. 41.5 millimeter case, no date, cream colored, lacquered, glossy dial, beautifully balanced with a vintage inspired twin register chronograph that's also a Rattrapont with a lot of the in house watchmaking done by Zin. They actually modified the 7750 to a column wheel and a split second. 100 meters water resistant. It looks great on both the bracelet and the strap. You have both options. This was a model from 2016 in honor of, well, 55 years of Zinn. A lovely piece, a fun watch, but I'm going to say this. At 41.5, it might be slightly too large for some people's dress watch tastes. So don't overlook Omega's DeVille line. Now, they come in all sizes. I happen to like the 41. Most examples are available in stainless steel and offer 100 meter water resistance. And like the Rolex Date 8, what you're looking at inside these watches fundamentally is the same movement architecture you get in all of the automatic Seamasters and Speedmasters, which is to say it's a sports watch movement on the inside. It's not a fragile watch. I'll also say that for good measure, many of them also look great on NATO straps. And if you're gonna wear this watch to swim, First of all, you can absolutely wear that with a suit and dress attire, but that's also how you would want it set up for swimming. I would probably eschew some sort of rubber option on a dress watch. Go with the NATO. It fits in the modern paradigm. Jumping into our chat box, I can see Dustin Van Patten saying, rotating bezel Milgauss teaser. Yes, that's true. There, <laughs> maybe, you never know what's coming at Basel this year, guys, but that's a great vintage option if you've got the budget, the patience, and the expertise to vet them. I can see right here, Eddie Landsberg saying that the SMP from Omega is an impeccable watch, and I can see some friends right in here. Blue Shirt Buddha asking the watch lounge, how do you like the new Seamaster? I'll opine on that. I love the new Seamaster. For under five grand, get the watch on a strap. You cannot do any better in the dive class. It makes the Planet Ocean obsolete in Omega's own lineup, and it rivals the Rolex Sub. The Sub's got to raise its game. Again, fast forward to Basel 2019, but that's certainly on the table. Jumping back into the chat box tonight, we have... George V asking Tim, hey, best bet, a Laurent Ferry Galet Square or an F. Pigeon Chronomet Souverain? I like the Galet Square better. For me, the Chronomet Souverain, at least in its non-Holland and Holland iteration, is a little bit too busy. I don't love the studied asymmetry of that dial. I really like the Galet Square, and I absolutely love it with the fully loomed Boreal dial. I would pick that. More friends joining in. I can see Cull Obsidian asking, Tim, will you be at Basel? It's a little bit up in the air right now, but I'm leaning towards yes. We have to put a few things together to make it happen. And then finally, Vlad T asking, Tim, what's your opinion on the Eterna, Con the Eterna Royal Contiki Chronograph in-house 39 Jewel? Long power reserve, standard flyback, modular potential, a great movement from a great manufacturer. Eterna, the original parent of ETA. I know it's kind of like the minnow spawning the whale, but that is how it went down in the 1920s. I love the Royal Contiki, and I'm a big fan of the Caliber 39, especially in its manual wine variants, like with the Oak and Oscar Jackson. 
And finally, Eddie Landsberg asking Aquaterra or DeVille. I kind of like the DeVilles, honestly. I don't need 150 meter water resistance. I can get away with 100. I can swim with that and be perfectly happy. So I'm going to go with the DeVille between the two. And I'm going to go with the DeVille Hour Vision Stainless Steel Blue Dial. Lovely piece. Main feature of the evening. The most controversial brand in the industry. This is the trial of Richard Mille. And it started with the user question. Nolan B. asks, Tim, what is the most controversial watch or brand on the market? I see a ton of forum fights over Rolex, Hublot, a little bit of Panerai, but is it because they're that polarizing or just because they're common enough to spawn gripes like any popular brand will? Well, Nolan, all three of those. There's a fair amount of controversy born of sheer ubiquity in Rolex's case and deliberate provocation in Ublos. I find that actual Rolex hate is born less of an allegiance to other brands or educated differences of opinions, more like peevish sophomore collectors who've only just been disabused of their prior belief that Rolex is the greatest watch in the world, and this is some sort of overcompensation that follows. So, veteran collectors generally have either a, a distaste for Rolex, but a respect for Rolex, whereas veteran collectors who don't have a distaste for Rolex generally love the brand. So it comes down to those who like and love and those who don't like but respect among those who know what Rolex is all about. If you can get past the baggage, the mainstream gen pop appeal, and the endless counterfeits, there's a lot to love and respect about Rolex. But while Hublot embraces its love-hate public persona, it is actually not the industry's foremost practitioner of this idea as a marketing strategy. My impression from inside the industry over the last five years, from veteran collectors, business professionals, and journalists, is that the most controversial brand is Richard Mille. Herewith, a case of charges against Richard Mille with a vigorous defense to follow. Richard, you're in the docket right now. Okay, the case against, let's start with the most basic. Price, for what you get, volume Richard Mille watches, and he makes about 5,000 a year, are priced outrageously. A mass-produced RM02 Titanium with a purchased Dubois de Praz annual calendar flyback chronograph module and a purchased Vauche base caliber costs $157,000. You can find that same DD module on old watches from Maurice Lacroix and Ulysse Norden. Needless to say, those cost less. For example, and comparison with something else high horology, a JLC Extreme Lab 2 a watch excruciatingly developed in-house with shock-resistant case, quick-release strap, a column wheel for its multifunction crown, a digital chronograph, a GMT, automatic winding, a 65-hour power reserve, vertical clutch, column wheel chronograph, all of this costs 50,000 US dollars. Now, run this through RM's price logic and on the other side of the algorithm, you would have that JLC costing somewhere between 250,000 and $300,000. Now, next, image. It's overpowering. RM sells a lifestyle, not a watch. That's RM and Sly, that's RM with Ron Dennis and Jensen Button, but you see where I'm going with this. It's a non-stop circuit. To many of us who are in this pastime for the quiet camaraderie and the romance of pre-modern craft traditions, this same non-stop circus of RM celebrity prices and promotions can wear thin and lead to some soul searching about the integrity of the watch hobby itself. Also, we need to talk about component outsourcing, and not just one or two, basically the entire watch. Let me be clear, I have no problem with this when it's done openly and marketed with integrity. Laurent Ferrier's dials, cases, clasps, straps, and movement components are a great example of outsourcing done right. They hide nothing and they claim no exclusive genius, plus they sell their steel watches for about $40,000 with all the refinements attendant. Given RM prices, I'm bothered by the fact that that $157,000 RM1102 with its annual calendar flyback chrono module can be found in functional equivalent, the exact same Dubois de Praz module in a used Maurice Lacroix that I can score for under $3,500 on Chrono24. Look at where the double digit date is. Look at where the month of the annual calendar is. Look at the layout of the chronograph and the flyback functionality. It's the same module. Okay, now, 
I'm also going to mention marketing cynicism because this grates on me. Many folks, myself included, wondered if Richard Mill's 2019 SIHH valedictory, they're leaving the show for next year, so this was their last year, but the Bon Bon collection. We wondered if this wasn't some sort of emperor's new clothes hustle. Or, in non-literary terms, the 1917 Marcel Duchamp urinal fountain, which subsequently sold for $1.7 million at Sotheby's in 1999. While this could be fun, this bonbon collection, at a lower price point, the candy watches of this year, which were marketed as unisex, are priced at roughly $123,000 to $160,000. What makes them different? Well, they have candy colors and candy dials. Mechanically, structurally, they are previous references, just made weird. In short, some members of the press and collectors wondered if the entire RM Bonbon enterprise wasn't a sort of statement to the effect that RM can literally sell anything to the people who bought into RM's cultivated image. I heard more than one or two people say this on the show floor. Basically, is this some sort of elaborate hustle? And when you have to ask a question like that, something's gone wrong. Now, I can see some friends joining in. Uh, hello, Tim, where are CQ and Claudio? They'll be back. In general, we have either CQ, Claudio, or Jason Main live in the chat box, but they'll be back in separate programs on the channel. And I can see right here Matt Foster saying, at that price, get the 30-second Grubel 4C Tourbillon pre-owned. That is right. For Richard Meal prices, you can get that Grubel 4C 24-second Tourbillon and all the fine finish, high horology, and traditional assembly with hand tools that comes with Grubel 4C ownership. Remember, RM, 5,000 watches a year. Grubel, about 80. Now, in defense of Richard Mule, because controversy involves two sides. Here's how it works. First, RM on the customer caliber count and customer components. RM works with top-notch suppliers. Unimpeachable stuff going into these watches. Let's start with Valjean for cases. RM turns to one of its equity stakeholders, Dominique Gounat and his Valjean Enterprise. This is a thing. These Valjean cases are of industry-leading quality, manufactured in many different materials, impeccably finished and assembled. And Richard Mill, or its proper entity name, Orometry SA, has made real investments in Valjean's facilities and partners. In 2013, RM created ProArt SA to act as its high-end primary source fabrication for all cases in all case materials. And RM, Valjean, and NTPT, which is a materials supplier, all represented in this image actually got together last fall and created a new clean room expressly for RM case fabrication. It includes positive pressurization, filtration, machining, an autoclave, carbon layup, all of this expensively assembled specifically for Richard Mill's use. So technically, yes, this is a form of outsourcing. It will be done on the premises of another company. But I think it's also clear that RM is really making an investment and doing something more than mailing a letter to somebody else's factory with a check and close. Now, more suppliers. Dubois de Praz and Vaucher Manufacture. Dubois de Praz of Lalou. They are a world leader in complication modules as featured on brands as far flung and respectable as Audemars Piguet and Jager Lecoultre. In other words, these guys are prime time. They are for real. No apologies necessary. Vaucher Manufacture, producing the base calibers, is the movement powerhouse and an arm of Parmigiani. And we don't need to recount their pedigree here or their capabilities, as good as anything in the world. Literally as good as anything you'll see in Glace Souta or Le Sentier at Jager Le Coult. And I'll mention, if you're gonna buy, buy from the best. Moreover, huge customization of the basic modules and calibers are performed in the name of Richard Mille. So, for example, here's a standard caliber from Vauche. This is what it would look like if you bought it off the shelf. You send the check, the factory sends you a movement. And here's an RM base of the same technical origin. Can we go full screen with this, guys? This is the same core genus, highly modified and mutated for RM, with grade five titanium bridges and plates, skeletonized bridges, variable inertia winding system, clear sapphire pivots, and shock absorber couplings. By the same token, here's a standard Dubois de Praz chronograph module. This is what it looks like if you buy it off the shelf. And here it is, shaped, skeletonized, and decorated, rendered in titanium for loop level scrutiny on an RM dial. Big change. 
The moral of the story is the same as I've always preached, which is to judge a customer caliber by modifications, value added, and improvements made to suit the application, not by the lack of in-house pedigree. For example, and here's another great instructive photograph right here, a PAM 318. So this is a Panerai PAM 318, famously known as the Brooklyn Bridge reference, and right in there is a completely unmodified Unitas 6497. That's what it looks like when it comes out of the box. And here is a Molnar Fabri, proving just how much of change you can render on the basic material. This thing is not even related to what you saw in the case back of the Panerai. With Richard Neal, the difference is this stark, this dramatic, and it does include this much value added for the end user. One more supplier, Audemars Piguet. More specifically, Audemars Piguet Renault Papi, or as they're known, watchmakers to the gods. All of the ultra high met and horlogerie, Richard Mille watches, the high mech stuff like that RM2701 Rafa Nadal, that's made by the high end of Audemars Piguet. The Finnish engineering, the watchmaking, the craft art, and the traditional applications that go into that are as good as anything you will find in the Supersonery or the Royal Oak Concepts because they're made and engineered by the same people. None in the world is better. Okay, let me defend celebrity and ambassadors. RM's celebrity branded watches actually relate to the luminaries and what they do. Here's the thing, go back to that high mech watch, the Rafael Nadal RM2701. This is a full watch with a strap, composite construction, 19 grams for the whole thing. It's a shockproof tourbillon. It's an extended power reserve. It's ergonomically superb. Everything about this watch is tailored for use in professional tennis. It's not a goof. It's not a photo op. It really works in that application. And I'll mention that RM has worked with APRP to develop not one, but two by the way, I think we also have an image of the pulley inside that thing. Can we go back to the pulley that's inside the Rolf Nadal. It's a very cool micro suspension system. That's what it actually looks like if you tear it apart and look at it under a loop. There is a mini steel wire and a pulley. Now, back to Pablo McDonnell. Richard Mill made not one, but two indestructible tourbillon watches for polo star Pablo McDonough. And here's the thing. This was completely unnecessary. RM gave McDonough an RM10 to wear for photo ops when he was off the horse. Most watch brands would have stopped right there, taken the photos, sent out the press kits, and booked their ads with the magazines. That would have been the end of it. RM wanted the watch destroyed in actual polo use so they could use it as a basis to start work on the proper RM53 series. So it was the basis for creating actual indestructible watches and they sacrificed a watch plus instant gratification and photos of their man wearing their watch. RM, and I have to say, really went the extra mile because most brands would have stopped at the first bug-eyed, tungsten carbide-capped RM53 tourbillon of 2012. But Richard Mill came back last year in 2018 with a $900,000 second model, this one featuring multi-laminate sapphire that was unbreakable, NTPT casing, and 10 pulleys suspending the movement on a wire so you could actually read the watch now, unlike the first Pablo McDonough. This was not necessary. The first watch was not necessary. They went the extra mile, and then they went the second extra mile. As far as I know, the marathon continues, and there's going to be a third one. Finally, there was last year's frankly absurd and hideous RM2501 for Sylvester Stallone. Guys, avert your eyes. We're going to go full screen on this so you can see what RM and Sylvester hath wrought. And yes, that is a capsule on the flank that will purify your water. It also has a compass and a level. This is ridiculous. It's insane, garish, repulsive in almost every way, but it does seem like something Stallone himself would wear and design. In that sense, RM did far, far more than the usual luxury watch sponsor of a celebrity, which would have pulled a stock watch off the shelf, declared it George Clooney's choice, and called it a day. Yeah, I'll bet. That's the Omega way. That's not the RM way, and I admire RM's way or Stallone's choice, but you get the picture. Scratch building this hideous RM2501, it wasn't necessary to secure an endorsement from a major actor, and we've seen that countless times from Breitling, Rolex, and Omega. This was actually doing things the hard way. 
Which brings me to the customer experience, and this is key. Since people started asking me about buying watches, I've repeated that the key to lasting satisfaction with your watch purchase is to find a way to elevate the purchase to the level of an experience, especially an ongoing experience. Meet other collectors, buy your watch to mark a major life milestone, and take your watch on adventures big and small. No brand in the industry does a better job than Richard Meal of elevating its watches from purchase to experience and lifestyle. Here's a first-hand example that I experienced. Waco, who by miraculous happenstance uh, showed up in a Google image search with both with Richard Mille and Rafael Nadal, visited us last year in the winter. He filmed some spots with me around Philadelphia related to watches, but he wanted to see the Rocky statue that's near the iconic steps of the Philadelphia Art Museum. It's from the movie. And by divine intervention, Sylvester Stallone himself was actually there that day at that moment at that statue promoting Creed II. And Wei was thrilled by this. We're talking about a guy who has all the money, fame, and influence any of us in the watch world could ever imagine or want. He's got it made. He's not easily impressed. And just seeing Stallone from 40 feet away behind a police barricade made this guy's day. He's done it all, he's seen it all, and this was the highlight of his visit to Philly. He was genuinely into it. Now imagine if you were a wealthy fan of Stallone or his movies, your big Expendables fan, let's say a latter-day Stallone enthusiast, who bought the RM2501 and got to attend the rollout party with their man himself. Is he Rocky? Is he Rambo? It doesn't matter. Buy this watch, you're going to get to shake his hand and party with him. But if you're not into Stallone, or an outing with Fernando Alonso, the two-time Formula One world champion and now endurance racer, or a dinner with Rafael Nadal, or a red carpet event with Jackie Chan. And that's before we even discuss all of the cool events that RM sponsors and invites you to attend, sometimes even pays you to attend if you buy their watches. Opening the door to everything from vintage auto racing to mega yacht regattas. And the company does a brisk business scheduling these things. One of the reasons they're withdrawing from SIHH next year is because they want to do more direct to customer events. That's going to include parties, races, sporting events, and intimate engagements with the people who make the watches possible. The invitations just keep coming. I have it on good account from Richard Mill owners. This is a lifestyle. And this is one of the reasons that RM owners have such a secret handshake camaraderie that seems weird to outsiders and non-RM folks. And if you're still cool or standoffish to the entire RM circus, buy the man himself, and there are good reasons to do that. First, he is easily the most ubiquitous, gregarious, and engaging ambassador for any brand anywhere in the industry. He happens to be one and the same as the Richard Mill brand. RM the man is not a watchmaker, and that's actually a good thing. I've met a lot of watchmakers behind these luxury brands. By all accounts, RM, in contrast to most watchmakers, especially celebrity watchmakers, is approachable, sincere, warm, uh, warm genuinely enthused about cars, travel, sports, and the exhausting pageantry that surrounds his watch company. Can you imagine F.P. Jorn smiling sincerely and shaking hands for five hours, pressing the flesh at some sort of convention expressly for the sake of his collectors, not him? I can't. I'm not even sure I could put up with that, but I know a guy who can. Which is to say, that brings us to our conclusion. I think Richard Mule watches, at least the mass-produced ones not made by APRP, are hideously overpriced as watches. But... If you include the fun of wearing them, of meeting other RM collectors, of circling the globe going to races and Concorde d'Elegance and wine tastings and yacht races and exotic events that only the RM circus seems to put on, then suddenly the RM11 at $150,000 might start to make sense. Think of it as a $50,000 watch and $100,000 to play a role in a fabulous film. You're starring. You're in the spotlight, courtesy of Richard Mill. You're on the marquee. The APRP watches are spectacular and absolutely worth what RM asks for them, which is to say, do you buy into the RM image? If you do, innocent. If you don't, guilty as charged. 
Only you guys can pronounce the verdict. Let me know in the comments below. Now, viewer wrist shots, Josh B in the Watch Lounge, Rock Vintage and Contemporary Omega, Double Pumped and Double Time. Andrew K joins us from Birmingham, England with his Omega Seamaster Planet Ocean while waiting for a guitar session in a music store in the city of Black Sabbath's birth. Taylor Yu shares the Bradley by E1. It's a tactile watch designed for both sight and touch reading by the sight impaired. Steve S showcases his Ulysses Snorden mono pusher chronograph to close our book on the evening and I wanted to show last week's giveaway watch the Breitling Colt Sky Racer on the wrist of its proud new owner all of you guys all 10,000 of you who entered that competition thank you so much we're giving away an Omega Speedmaster we're gonna cut back to that that is the giveaway watch for the month of February it is a 145022 tritium dial true vintage from the 1970s I want you to win it but you got to be in it to win it link in the description send your wrist shots to Monday mailbag at thewatchbox.com to see your analog on my digital and finally comment below and check me out on Instagram Tim underscore Maso for the quick hit videos that continues after we go dark. Thanks to you. Thanks to my crew for making this possible. Time out, Tim out, and thanks for logging on.